Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Nurturing Social and Emotional Learning Through Nature and Play, featuring Marlene Powers of the Child and Nature Alliance of Canada, Brenda Simon of Opal Earth Day Canada, and hosted by the Ontario Australian Foundation's Artie Freeman. We're so excited to hear more about nurturing social and emotional learning through na nature and play. My name is Jack Gibbings, and I'm a community animator with the Tamarack Institute. And before we begin, I'm just going to go over a few technical details. Um, I want to begin by recognizing that Toronto, which is where we're hosting today's webinar, is located on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples dating back countless generations. I wish to acknowledge the, I wish to acknowledge the long history of First Nations and Métis people in Ontario and show respect to them today. Today's webinar is part two of our social and emotional uh, learning series, where we'll be interviewing and learning from several leaders within the field. To reduce noise and distractions, we have you all muted today, so no need to worry about any background noise coming from your line. For those of you that are joining online, I'll have you take a quick look at the GoToWebinar control panel at the, and at the bottom, you'll see a question box. If you run into any difficulties throughout this webinar, feel free to type into the, the, this box and I will be there to help you. Um, we will also have uh, be opening up the last 15 minutes of this webinar for questions and Q&A. So throughout the presentation, please type any questions you have into this question box and we'll try do our best to touch on them at the very end of the presentation. Unfortunately, if you're calling into this webinar on the phone, you don't have these features. However, you are more than welcome to email me directly at jack at tamarackcommunity.ca and I'll be monitoring that as well for interesting questions. So um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce today's host, Artie Freeman, the strategy lead for Promising Young People at the Ontario Trailing Foundation. Artie? Great, thank you, Jack. And I just wanna welcome everyone again to today's webinar. As Jack mentioned, my name is Artie Freeman. And I've been responsible for the development of the Ontario Trilliums Foundation investment area related to the positive development of children and youth. One of the outcomes we've been heavily investing in is really the social emotional development of uh, children and youth facing barriers. So I'm really looking forward to learning about how social emotional learning is supported through nature and play um, from our presenters today. So with that, I'd like to introduce Brenda Simon and Marlene Power. Brenda is the Director of Play Programs at Earth Day Canada and Canada's first certified OPAL mentor. Since 2013, Brenda has been introducing communities and schools to the concepts and practice of play provision and adventure play using loose parts and play work supervision. Since joining Earth Day Canada in 2015, Brenda has overseen the development of the OPAL program through partnership with three school boards in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area and with the support of the Ontario Trillium Foundation. OPAL is now active in 30 schools in Toronto, 25 in the Toronto District School Board, and it continues to expand. In collaboration with the Environment and Sustainability Community Advisory Committee, Brenda is working on recommendations for our play policy at the Toronto District School Board. Marlene um, Power, so in 2008, Marlene Power founded Carpridge for School, Canada's first outdoor nature-based forest preschool. And in 2012, she created the Forest Schools Canada, which is a national initiative to promote nature-based education through forest school professional learning. In 2014, she founded the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, which is situated on 90 acres of unceded Algonquin territory, currently identified as National Capital Commission land in Ottawa's Greenbelt. And in 2014, she was appointed the Executive Director for the Child and Nature Alliance of Canada. Marlene is an avid outdoors person, a social activist, an environmentalist, and an advocate of children's rights to play in the natural world. She attributes her own resilience, creativity, love of nature, and environmental values to the freedom she was given to roam during her childhood. She learned so much by growing up connected to the beauty of nature around her in Outport, Newfoundland. She currently lives in Ottawa, Ontario, and spends many days exploring the city streets and woods with her dog and her two children, Hazel and Emery. So I want to welcome both our presenters 
who are both really recognized leaders and experts in their fields. I, for one, am really excited to learn from their insights on uh, nature and play and the link between that and social emotional learning. Thank you, Artie. Yeah, no worries. Um, so before I turn to our presenters, I'd like to go through a few, few slides that explains what social emotional learning is. There's a lot of content in each slide, which is intentional on our part, just to ensure that um, after the presentation, participants will have access to the information uh, that's on there. But what I'm going to do is just go through a high level overview of each slide and you're able to produce it afterwards as well. So what is social emotional learning? In a nutshell, social emotional learning, also known as SEL, is the process of attaining and applying the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. The wheel on the left you see on the screen is taken from Castle, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. They're a great resource, and we have provided the link on the slide for your information as well. So the wheel describes the five main competencies of social emotional learning, as well as the environments and mechanisms needed to successfully support social and emotional learning. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure how that... Okay, sorry, Jack, would you mind just, yeah, doing the slides? So there are five main social emotional learning competencies. The self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. What we see here are the skills required to develop each competency. For example, the skills that support social awareness include empathy, being able to understand different perspectives and worldviews, respecting diversity, and understanding social norms. Essential uh, to those skills are that children and uh, those are sorry essential are those skills that children and youth need to learn to develop good social awareness. So by the same token, in order to support good relationship skills, children and youth need like things like communication, collaboration skills. They need to know how to resolve conflicts and ask for help when needed. So the same is true for the other competencies you see there. The skill sets underneath those competencies are essential to help children and youth develop those competencies. So self skills and competencies are developed over long periods of time. They can be taught in school and after school. While this slide does speak to the benefits of tapping into the adolescent brain, um, you know, Adolescent is a time where it's a real window of opportunity for building skills. And, it, and it's a time where um, brain research confirms that social emotional skills are malleable. So while that slide does talk about adolescent skills, it's important to, important, uh, to note that cell is essential in both the early years and in the middle years of development. So it's, it, essentially, social emotional learning is valuable for any age group from zero all the way to a young adult, but even for us today, um, more and more we're seeing the link between social emotional learning and 21st century skills, which is what the workplace of the future is really going to look for. So social emotional learning, as I mentioned, is essential to the positive development of children and youth. It builds resiliency, it provides young people with the ability to manage their emotions, and it drives them towards positive choices. So, you know, children become self-aware and they know they need to be in a positive and supportive environment to thrive. And when they're not, they know to leave. So that is what good social emotional learning helps children and young people do. So there's a lot of evidence that links social emotional learning to positive outcomes in education, employment, health, and income. We know that children do better academically. They have improved attitudes and behaviors. They exhibit le um, disrupt disruptive behaviors less often. Um, and they're more likely to graduate from high school and have a full-time job by the age of 20. So,
The other um, thing we know from research is that Cell has proven to provide an $11 research, uh, return on investment for every $1 invested in it. So more and more, as I mentioned earlier, companies are hiring for social emotional skills. Uh, just the other day, I happened to be on a website, which is an artificial intelligence platform that uses the video to suss out um, the social emotional skills of job applicants. So cannot stress enough, and I think everyone on the line, uh, probably, you know, you, you're well aware of the benefits of social emotional learning. So cannot stress that enough. And, um, and so therefore, you know, it's critical for every person. So how do we support social emotional learning? You know, I think the thing to note is that we all have roles to play in supporting the development of children and youth. Most of their time is spent in schools, and while parents also play a, a large role in their lives, communities can also play an active role in facilitating um, this to happen. So the Aspen Institute has released a publication that highlights where and when learning can happen and how communities can support that. So the four main ways they've identified include supporting communities to see the value and the vision for social emotional learning, ensuring access to data, so for instance, in Ontario, we have the Early Years Development Instrument, and it's indicated that children in 2013 were more vulnerable in social emotional domains than they were 10 years earlier. So data such as this can help communities plan and move forward and address gaps and challenges. The third way they mention is by ensuring high quality and year round programming to ensure learning is sustained and developed. And lastly, generating resources to realize the community's vision for social emotional learning. We've also provided that um, the link there to the research, so feel free to have a look at that later as well. So now that we've had a quick overview on social emotional learning, I'd like to move to our interview portion with our panelists to hear more about their programs and its link to social emotional learning. So with that, I'm really excited to turn it over to Brenda about the OPAL program. Thank you very much, Artie. Uh, I'm honored that you've included us in this, uh, in this presentation. So OPAL stands for Outdoor Plane Learning, and um, it is a program that is dedicated to improving, whoops, let's go back. It is a program that's dedicated to improving play in schools and um, there are many different bases for why we believe that play is important in schools and social emotional learning is definitely uh, right up there among the highest priorities that we see as outcomes of good quality play. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so right now we are very pleased to be able to say that we're working with three school boards primarily the toronto district school board we had one project up in the york region and we have six projects unrolling in the next uh, two to three years with the toronto catholic school board it is a program that's been adapted from a best practice established in the uk which has already seen 250 schools um, become OPAL schools. What we do is we bring together those non-parental figures that are so important to a child's development, school administrators, teachers, lunch supervisors are included, as well as parents and all support staff in the school to develop a strategy to enrich the uh, outdoor play environment at the school. It's a whole school community-based collaborative effort. Let's go to the next slide. So, okay, it seems to jump forward a little bit too quickly. Let's go back. This is the basic model for how we improve play. Jack, do you want to take over? Let's go to the next slide. The first thing, we're going to go back one. So the first thing we need to do is change supervision attitudes. 
Uh, currently, there's a tremendous amount of confusion, and so there's a social-emotional learning component that we have to undertake with the adults to get them to a place where they are much more comfortable with what it is that children do. So we develop, oops, so that's the primary top piece of our model, and then we uh, introduce materials or loose parts, and then we think about environmental improvements. So moving on to the next slide, this is um, the basic structure of an OPAL training. We start with policy and meetings among the adults. We move into strategy and implementation. And it takes, um, currently our commitment to schools is for two years. Most schools roll out in the first year, but we give them an extra year of support because it takes a long time to shift the culture of what could be as many as five, 600 people in a school, including the children, and they are very important co-creators of the program. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what OPAL starts to look like. Um, you start to see some of the things that already mentioned in her talk. Uh, you see more self-management, you see a social awareness, um, you see relationship skills evolving, and very often across barriers of age or gender or grade. And um, this creates a tremendously rich environment for social emotional learning. Let's go to the next slide. These are some more pictures of what happens at an OPAL school. We, yeah, so on the, on the upper left, you'll see that there's a little bit more risk taking. And this is part of the challenge for the supervisors to allow that to happen. There is definitely more mess. Um, you'll see that in the bottom slide. And this is, again, something that needs to be planned for. A certain amount of tolerance has to be built into the program uh, among parents as well as teachers. And on the upper right, you'll see uh, chaos, what looks like chaos. But in fact, it is um, a very creative kind of uh, diversity that's being created in that playground using loose parts um, to provide so many more opportunities for experimentation and collaboration for the students. Can we go to the next slide? The idea, let's go, let's move on. So the idea for OPAL developed in the UK, as I stated before, and it's now be highly respected as a best practice for student well-being. And um, we have, Earth Day Canada has imported this program. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and, and we have been very actively adapting it to our system, which is different because it's a, it's a centralized school board system, which is different from uh, the UK. The impetus for this change came as a result of a position statement that was issued by Participation, next slide, in 2015, which called for access to active play in nature and the outdoors as something essential for healthy child development. And both Marlene and I sat on the um, advisory group that painstakingly uh, came up with these words to describe what we were all, the change we were all hoping to see. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason why the position statement sort of gathered an umbrella of groups together to call for more active play is because of these abysmal uh, statistics around activity levels being very, very low among children. And and the realization that this was not only affecting their physical health, let's go to the next slide, um, because of course we all know that obesity is a serious problem, but we also know that that physical problem manifests itself in social and emotional ways, um, in uh, poor self-esteem, depression, eating disorders, uh, learning difficulties, and we have been seeing the a rise in anxiety among children amounting to almost a level of a crisis. Next slide, please. Um, that is, um, has been concurrent with the decline in children's time for free, unstructured, intrinsically motivated outdoor play. Why is play so important in schools? Let's go to the next slide. Um, if you add up the hours that children play in their so-called free time, recess and lunch, 
it actually amounts to 1.4 years of their school career. And so this is a huge piece of a child's life. And I think if you think back to your memories of school, you probably remember recess just as much as or more than you remember things that took place in the classroom. Next slide. If you add in the um, number of hours that many children spend in after school care, the amount of time they're spending in schoolyards is, is a very big piece of their life. And so improving this hour or two in the day is going to have huge impact. If we go to the next slide, this, this is something that has been recognized by the UN as um, endemic to a children's lives in the developed world and, and in the developing world. And the reasons for this are very complex. So I'm sort of working my way backwards about why OPAL came about. Could we go to the next slide? There's a real perception that childhood has changed uh, and that we need to take very active measures to ensure that children play, which is something that might have happened very naturally uh, when anybody, shall we say, over the age of 35 uh, in, this, in this webinar might remember that uh, play was just something you did, nobody got involved. That's, that feels like it's becoming more and more difficult in our urbanized worlds, and uh, especially when we're competing with the, with the screen. I haven't seen any evidence that um, great uh, gaming improves social emotional learning. Next slide, please. However, we do know that there is increasing an increasing body of evidence showing that active, full-bodied play in or near nature uh, really does promote uh, self-awareness, self-management, uh, collaboration. Uh, decision making, all these things that Artie has mentioned earlier. Could we go to the next slide, please? In terms of, um, oh, let's skip over this slide. And I'm just going to take a moment to reiterate uh, what I mean by play. Um, we follow, at Earth Day Canada, we follow the International Play Association's definition of play, which is recognized by UNICEF and the United Nations. And it's these six carefully chosen words, freely chosen, personally directed, and intrinsically motivated. And it's, the, it's this freedom to choose and figure things out for themselves and that seems to really lay a lot of the groundwork for the kind of conscious social emotional learning that already has been speaking about where teachers or other adults can uh, help a child give words to what it is they have experienced. Let's, let's go on to the next slide. So the research about OPAL is showing us that accidents and incidents at recess decrease. Uh, we have a decline in recorded behavioral problems. Children are playing much more creatively. The supervisors of play, whether they're lunch supervisors or teachers, report that they enjoy their jobs more. The children form much wider social groupings and have a much wider circle of friends in the playground. And the children seem to be very actively engaged and will vigorously defend their program if for some reason the adults, uh, uh, I won't say shut it down, but if for some reason the program goes on pause for any reason, uh, we know that there are schools where students are raising petitions to reopen OPAL. So it's very, very important to keep in mind that the dis uh, so much of the social emotional learning uh, comes from the um, students making decisions about their own program. Um, a Ryerson study of OPAL has shown that student perceptions of well-being improve when they have regular access to this kind of play. And um, we're looking at a second follow-up study by this same team uh, in the next 18 months. So I want to dig down a little bit um, into some of the science. I'm not a scientist, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to go with the popular science 
to talk about why social emotional learning is reinforced by play. Could we get to the next slide, please? So it seems that um, play is an evolutionary instinct and any social animal, um, uh, primarily mammals, although there has been some uh, observation of uh, um, other kinds of animals also engaging in play, we see a lot of play behavior among youthful animals. Um, play is a child determined experience, next slide please, which is forming uh, structures of intelligence. It's um, and for the most part, it is not teachable. Social emotional learning is teachable, but it's it it operates on the foundation of play, which is built into experience, and it's very tied up with. So play is um, how we discover agency. Next slide, please, and thinking and doing are very connected. Uh, there isn't a lot of, the, of planning in play. It's mostly doing and then analyzing. Um, this is taken from the uh, self-regulation world and the idea that um, was developed as polyvagal theory. The the concept of hormesis is the idea that we actually learn by experiencing manageable levels of stress. In the same way that we build our muscles by stressing them through exercise, we can also build social emotional learning by experiencing manage manageable levels of stress. The vagal nerve, which is that yellow nerve uh, on the picture on the left, winds its way through all of the organs of the body. It is the nerve that tells our alarm systems to stand down, it's okay, we're just playing. And um, there's something called vagal tone, which is how we learn to, to manage stress. Um, and you can see that this happens in a lot of different forms of play. Let's go to the next slide. So when children are allowed a little bit of rough and tumble, they, and a little bit of risky play, they're, they're developing vagal tone. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to go through these rather quickly, Jack. So um, we see a lot of collaboration, a lot of teamwork. Next slide. And uh, inclusion. And all of this is very exciting. And so it stimulates the body without uh, overstimulating. And we also see a lot of self-regulation that is active through play. So calming down. The physical literacy and the teamwork go along with the, uh, the social emotional piece, the self-management and self-awareness. Let's go to the next slide. This is a picture of failure, but the children don't know it's failure. They think they're playing. Both of them were trying to build something that they didn't succeed in making, but whatever they did succeed in making became what they were trying to do. So a very good definition of play is learning how to fail really well. And, um, and through those failures, developing resilience and uh, humor, and also meeting other, other, other people, other conscious, consciousness, uh, other minds and other bodies through those failures. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, and the next slide. So brain research and the science of epigenetics really support the importance of play throughout the lifespan. We've learned that genetic expression can be unlocked through experience and also shut down through experience. And we know that the brain is always changing. It's extremely plastic. In fact, um, there is kind of an outer space of neural connection in our brain. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's, it's a kind of a, a universe and play is constantly building those connections. So um, since we're talking very high level science here, um, I thought that I would bring in the Vulcan perspective on play and the human condition. Um, 
hopefully some of you out there remember the original Dr. Spock, who seemed to know a great deal about these strange creatures called human beings. So what Dr. Spock tells us is that there's something called the brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's called BDNF, and it's been dubbed miracle grow for the brain. And what it does is it stimulates brain cell growth, which is also called neurogenesis. This is something that's taking place all through the lifespan, primarily through the movement, movement of the body, which is why it's so important for children to get out to play and also so important for everyone to do that during their, uh, right into old age. So on planet Earth, uh, we have experienced this process called neoteny, which is that even though we are men, Mammals, like the dogs and the dolphins, we tend not to age in the same way. We remain youthful through this process of neurogenesis. That means that we will be, in some way, emotionally immature for all of our lives. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, Dr. Spock thinks that's um, rather unfortunate, but Captain Kirk says that what Spock calls emotional immaturity is what we call the genius of childhood. It is playfulness, imagination, curiosity, adaptability, art, and even science. Next slide, please. So the brain is like a muscle. It adapts and changes throughout the lifespan based on this youthful quality of neurogenesis. And um, that means that social emotional learning will be part of our life uh, right into old age because there's something about being an adult that is still very similar to being a child. Let's go to the last slide. And the last one. Next slide, please. So creativity consists in maintaining a key aspect of the experience of childhood throughout one's life, the capacity to create and recreate the world. And um, this capacity is completely tied up with the social emotional learning that takes place through play. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, Brenda, I certainly got a lot out of that. I think the one big aha for me is about play needing to be a child determined experience you know you had mentioned things like freely choose personally directed and intrinsically motivated and the freedom to choose and figure things out like that connection for me i think has become really really clear as to how then that supports social emotional learning so i do really want to thank you for that i would want to remind folks on the line if you have any question out please um Put them in the chat box on um, the panel that you see on the side and um, we will make sure to get to them but for now i'm very excited as well to introduce um marlene who's going to walk us through um the child and nature alliance and for schools camp great thank you and thank you brenda i uh, i loved i loved uh, all the elements that you brought into your presentation and uh, i'm really going to try to build off of what you shared because there is a lot of overlap in our work and already you just mentioned one of them in terms of um, the definition of play that both uh, earth day canada and opal um, has uh, has adopted as well as uh, as well as our work so um, there's certainly overlap in in terms of um, in terms of uh, the kind of play that we want to support in the world um, and the kinds of experiences we want to support for children. Um, so I'm going to try to, uh, there we go. Okay, um, so I'm going to dive in. I, I am going to play off of, uh, of Brenda's presentation. I'm going to maybe not touch as much on the, the research because I think you did a really, really great job um, at, at that, Brenda. And, um, I, I'd like to um, maybe start off and give you a sense of, of who I am because all you hear is a voice. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm currently based in Ottawa, but this is actually a picture of me when I was about seven years old. Um, and I, I like to share this because because uh, this is very much where where all of this began in my own childhood. Um, 
uh, in terms of play, but also my passion and, and love uh, of the natural world. Um, uh, play for me also began on the the cliffs and uh, the the wharfs of uh, of Newfoundland, um, and so I played on on the shores. I grew up in Newfoundland um, and have have wound up in in on the mainland in Ottawa. Um, but this is a, a, a typical landscape, uh, typical Newfoundland landscape, just overlooking on the other side of the Narrows. Um, but I also want to share um, uh, the next slide, which is. Um, this is also where I played. I grew up in social housing in St. John's for, for a large part of my childhood. And so um, I want to uh, maybe dispel some myths that, uh, you know, that play is for the privileged, because um, that's a comment I get uh, quite a bit in, in, in this work. Um, and I'm a huge advocate that children, all children should have access uh, to play. And that very much stems uh, from my own childhood. And and my experiences uh, playing here in, in social housing. Um, so uh, I'm, this picture is my daughter, Hazel, um, and Hazel inspired uh, very, very much for me, she inspired the start of uh, me launching the uh, Carpridge Forest Preschool in 2008. Um, Hazel now claims that she likes bath bombs and malls more than the natural world. Um, she's 12 years old. Um, so, our, you know, our, our world is certainly no, you know, nature or outdoor play utopia. Um, she is a typical, you know, 12 year old old, um, but she has uh, very much inspired this work for me. Um, and this is my son, Emery. Um, Emery currently attends the Ottawa Forest and Nature School one day a week on Tuesdays. And um, I'm, I'm proud to say that Emery might be the world's best um, and most gentle uh, salamander seeker in the forest. Um, so to uh, to me, um, this is a picture recently of me um, in Berlin. This is uh, I joke that this is a picture of me in my office and and where I'm most comfortable. Um, and uh, uh, I am the executive director of the Child and Nature Alliance. Um, and um, I, I guess maybe before I dive into Forest and Nature School and Forest School Canada, I, I want to say that. Um, that uh, play and connection to nature, um, you know, is 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 very much not um, a, a concept, as I mentioned, for the privilege, and and nor is it a, a utopia. Um, we're here to talk about social and emotional learning, um, and I think that a big piece of that work for us is. Um, is not trying to paint uh, play or connection to nature or forest and nature school um, in this like idealized light. Um, play is messy and children still have meltdowns in the forest and children still get cold and still have lots of emotions. Um, and that's part of the beauty is that, uh, that all of those things can exist um, uh, in this space. Um, so, uh, our vision is is on the screen. So our vision is that all Canadian children and youth play and learn in forests, parks, meadows, and mud puddles. Um, I wanted to highlight that early in this presentation because I I also wanted to share that we believe this is possible. Um, I think there there are lots of challenges and and barriers. Um, currently that are impeding upon children's access to play and access to the natural world. Um, but we do this work and we, um, me and my staff get up every day and, and feel very hopeful um, and very excited um, uh, about, uh, about, about this work and, and we believe it's possible. Um, we also think that play is, is a really critical um, and joyful pathway to learning and development um, and social and emotional learning. So I, I hope to shed some light um, on that uh, for you today. Um, bear with me, I'm, I think I just skipped a couple, let me go back. Okay. Um, so Forest and Nature School, um, I'll get into the definition of Forest and Nature School for those of you who aren't familiar um, in just a little bit, but I, but I wanted to, to highlight um, that Forest and Nature School, and, and I would argue outdoor play, is really about allowing um, space for the whole person. Um, and I think there's something really beautiful about the natural world when, when literally you remove four walls and when children are provided uh, opportunity to experience freedom. Um, there's something really unique 
um, that happens. And, and my uh, staff, uh, you, we use the word magic uh, quite a bit, but there is something magical where, where the whole child um, and the whole adult in terms of the educator can be present. Um, and I, I believe a big part of the social and emotional impact of forest and nature school and outdoor play um, is that um, is that uh, it's an opportunity for us to truly show up. Um, so for educators to show up and uh, and to be present for children, and and also the opportunity for children to to show up. And I'll uh, I'll shed some light on what I mean by by showing up um, throughout uh, the presentation. There we go. Um, so this is a picture. This is a picture of two of our educators, Jen and Carrie, here at the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, our headquarters. Um, this is uh, this is Carrie and Jen prepping their classroom, um, and I can assure you that every day they're showing up. Um, and and when they're showing up, um, you know, they're shoveling out our fire pit, or they're you know prepping uh, the seating area. Um, but but more than that, they're emotionally uh, showing up, and and I think that that um, is is really exciting. Um, I'll highlight a couple of um, a little bit of the research on on some of the social and emotional outcomes or, or student well-being outcomes um, for for children who attend uh, forest and nature school as well as uh, children who have opportunities to um, experience outdoor play um, some of the research suggests that that's uh, uh, there's a lowered um, stress and anxiety levels for children who have opportunities for active outdoor play um, increased energy and self-esteem and overall well-being. Um, also, uh, I think Brenda highlighted the position statement in her pre presentation um, that was published by the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Team through Participation. Um, and a couple of interesting findings from that position statement and the two systematic reviews that informed the position statement. Um, outdoor play in, in natural environments um, supports resilience, self-regulation, and skills for dealing uh, with stress later in life. So it's not just children don't just reap the benefits um, of outdoor play. And I, I would also argue that educators don't just reap, reap the benefits, um, some of those social and emotional benefits in the moments. So they're also carrying those benefits with them for the long term. Um, the challenges, uh, you know, currently that we face in in supporting children's connection to the land and supporting outdoor play um, are quite complex. Um, and we strive as an organization to identify what those barriers and those challenges are, but also to um, really take a strengths-based approach and and talk about what the opportunities are and what the strengths are. Um, that being said. Uh, one of the greatest barriers uh, that are current, you know, currently um, inhibiting children's outdoor play experiences are, um, and Brenda uh, definitely highlighted this in her presentation, uh, parental anxieties and perceptions of sa safety and risk. Um, and that continues to be a predominant theme. It's, it's actually one of the, the reasons why the position statement uh, was published in, in 2015. Um, and many organizations across Canada are working um, um, now to address those those perceptions of safety and risk um, and, and the parental anxieties as well. Uh, one way that we are tackling that in our work um, is to have a lot of conversations about trust. I think the uh, uh, you know, when we, uh, you know, it's absolutely normal to have anxieties as a parent and to, con to be concerned about the safety and well-being of children. Um, and we need to also make sure that we are opening up doors for children to experience outdoor play. Um, and I think more and more conversations about trust and about children as competent and capable and helping to um, really unpack that and understand what that means uh, is an important, um, it, it's, it's going to be an important part of our work for sure over the next five years. Um, before I move on to the next slide, uh, I'm going to reference um, 
a friend of mine, my, my friend uh, Natalie, uh, she uses a quote, um, children, and she actually uses this quote about herself, but I relate this to, to children in, in our work. Um, children uh, need both a secure home and a place to roam, which is really connected to attachment theory. Um, so we're looking to provide, you know, a container for children's experiences in the natural world and security um, while they learn and while they play, and then lots of freedom um, and to trust them in their ability to roam. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show a few slides and, and tell a few stories um, to illustrate what we might mean by social and emotional learning in a forest and nature school setting. Um, so this is a, a picture that was drawn by a child at the Ottawa Forest and Nature School and, and children um, are often grouped into uh, like the wolf pack or, or wolf owls, different animal names that they may decide. So this was, uh, this was the wolf pack. Um, this group of children um, the week prior to this developed, uh, they were, sorry, they were uh, on, on site one day in, uh, in the winter and they saw a whole bunch of eagles flying overhead um, and, and an inquiry started and lots of questions and curiosity emerged why the eagles were on the land and why are they circling and, and why haven't they left. Um, so later in the day, they decided to go where, where the eagles were to see what was down below um, and they found um, a dead deer that that had been uh, possibly attacked by a coyote um, the night before, uh, which led to lots of really rich conversations around um, around uh, uh, around death and dying, and around um, our feelings and around the natural world and about the life cycle um, and all kinds of other things, um, which is is just one example of how the natural world can offer provocations and prompts um, to help us dive into our emotional landscape. Um, the next image, uh, this I, I love. Um, I walked into our site one day and I, I couldn't find the children. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't teaching, obviously. Uh, the educators were, were with, with uh, the children, um, but there was no child left inside. There were a million backpacks kind of strewn throughout our cabin and throughout our yurt, um, but no child could be found. And I thought that was um, a really, a really beautiful moment. Um, this is a, a, a picture of a group of preschool children um, and the preschool children come for a half day a week um, to the Ottawa Forest and Nature School. So um, this was a group of, of preschool children and um, it, this is just an example of literacy and loose parts. You see lots of loose parts strewn about. Um, the children are determining what height they feel comfortable on. Some children are comfortable on a high stump and some children aren't comfortable on a stump at all some children feel comfortable sitting down. Um, that self-determination is a really big part of, uh, of Forest and Nature School and children deciding and determining for themselves what feels right and what feels good and what feels safe. Um, so rather than us determining that for them, um, they have many, many opportunities in their play and throughout their days to make those decisions themselves. Um, I'll illustrate one other example, um, a preschool group, um, a few years ago uh, showed up, it was kind of the end of winter, kind of maybe around this time of year when everyone's tired and everyone's exhausted and everyone's complaining and maybe there was a full moon. Um, and uh, the group of children, like we hadn't even really started the day and there was already like kind of fighting and bickering and complaining. Um, and so our educator at the time, Petra, um, who got this from an, uh, another educator that she had worked with, um, she hosted a morning complaining service. Circle. So rather than try to shut down the complaining, she invited it and she welcomed it. Um, and we spent, uh, we put a timer on and we spent uh, about, uh, I think in total it was three minutes, but the activity took about 15 minutes. Um, and for 15 minutes while the timer was on, we, um, we welcomed children to complain about breakfast and about their parents and about, you know, their shoe not fitting properly and about their hands being cold and their hands being wet. And I think that's another amazing example 
example of how we support um, the whole child um, and our whole selves uh, and that emotional landscape um, in the natural world and, and through Forest and Nature School by saying like all feelings are welcome here. <laughs> we, do, we don't just want like happy compliant children. We want children who are curious and who, um, you know, who are asking really deep questions and who are, who are looking inward uh, as well. Um, this is a quote from an older group of children uh, that attended our programs, I think through, yeah, through the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. Um, and one child said, when I'm at forest school, I can climb trees. If I climb really high, I can see the birds. I've never got lost in a tree though. I've never climbed that high. I've been lost in the woods before. That was cool. I found some tracks to find my way home. They were actually my tracks. It was muddy and that's how I got back. Um, and I think that's beautiful because, you know, it's a story about about the kinds of uh, adventures that can happen uh, in the forest and when you're outside of four walls. But it's also about, um, you know, I, I, I look at the metaphors also in this child's uh, story and um, and it's about finding our own internal um, navigation system. It's about trusting ourselves and our ability uh, to get back. And it's about trusting our own footsteps uh, in life. Uh, so I thought that was a really beautiful poetic metaphor even if that's not maybe what they meant <laughs> um, so now I'm going to define forest and nature school so um, for those of you who haven't heard that term, um, it's called many, many different things around the world, forest kindergarten, vault kindergarten, forest and nature school, nature kindergarten. Um, the name really doesn't matter. Uh, more and more in our work, we're highlighting uh, the principles, the competencies, and, and what we call the pedagogy, so how children learn uh, through play. Um, so the definition of forest and nature school, um, uh, this was defined by a collaborative group in 2004. 14, 2013 and 2014. Um, and the definition is essentially children learn through regular repeated experiences in the same natural place. Um, and then they also learn through play-based child-directed and inquiry-driven learning, which is in alignment with Brenda's, um, what she's described as, as the definition of play, intrinsically motivated self-directed uh, experiences. So the reason why we promote regular repeated experience in the same natural space is uh, we want to uh, foster relationships and we want to foster trust. Um, and so going back to the same place over an extended period of time, it's not a field trip, um, it's not a one-time experience, it's, it's a relationship building uh, process. Um, so Forest and Nature School, um, I sometimes joke that it, it has, it has um, I mean, it has everything to do with nature and, and the outdoors, um, and yet in some ways it has nothing to do with, with that. It has to do with a process and a relationship, um, and that's where the magic um, happens. Uh, Forest School Canada um, is a program of the Child and Nature Alliance. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into our work here today, but uh, please check out our website if, if you have uh, any questions about, about what we do. Um, we offer professional learning um, for the forest and nature school field. We also offer a variety of different workshops, um, a risky play workshop, um, an intro to forest and nature school, and so on and so forth. Um, we're also a certification body, so we provide um, a forest and nature school certification, and we're moving towards an accreditation body, being an accreditation body in uh, 2019. Um, some significant markers in time for us as, as an organization, um, and I would say for, for the forest and nature school movement in Canada, um, in 2008, the first forest preschool opened. Um, lots has happened since 2008. It's, it's really quite amazing. Um, and uh, you'll, you can come back and, and see this uh, for more information. Currently, I'll, I'll highlight, uh, we have 35 employees from coast to coast to coast, and we're in the process of scaling up all of our work and, and we're excited uh, to be doing that. Um, the next few images I'm not going to um, I'm not going to spend too long at. I'm going to flip through these. These are images of courses that we've delivered across Canada. So this was in uh, Calgary um, a couple of years ago. This is a really beautiful, beautiful um, 
woman, um, uh, beautiful two people actually, um, Lisa and her dad who, uh, who work in New Brunswick. Um, this was seven o'clock one morning in a practitioner's course and this is where I found Lisa and her dad. So I would argue that um, outdoor play in Forest and Nature School, um, you know, it's, it's really supports so social and emotional learning, um, uh, but it also supports uh, in children, but it also, you know, supports that for educators um, and, for, and for communities. Um, this is a course that we delivered uh, a little over a year ago on Manitoulin Island. Um, we were fortunate to have two elders, uh, Josh and Roberta, join us throughout the week. Um, uh, really beautiful stories unfolded on the land and really strengthened our organizational commitment um, to reconciliation. Um, this year we have a course being offered um, in New Brunswick in partnership with Three Nations. Um, and it's going to be a course for Indigenous educators and, in, and, and Indigenous early childhood educators. And, and we're really excited about uh, the stories and the learning that's unfolding um, for us uh, through that partnership. Lastly, um, there are many uh, different strategies. I wish I had more time. I'm going to end here. Um, lots of, of different, you know, principles that we're embedding into our practice. I've I've highlighted some of them. Um, one of the, uh, you know, I from experience and what I've had the opportunity to witness over the last ten years, um, the time and space that um, is provided to us and and that gift um, in the natural world is really where a lot of the music. Uh, the magic happens. Um, and then there's lots of other intentional strategies that are embedded into our professional training, um, like helping educators to understand what it means to meet uh, children where they're at and to meet um, uh, to meet families where they're at, uh, a relational approach to, to learning. Uh, what does it mean to put relationships first, establishing community standards um, rather than, rather than uh, a culture of compliance, um, a heavy focus on observation and communication skills and nonviolent communication has also really strengthened um, some of, of the, uh, the conversations, especially around social, uh, around well-being and social and emotional learning. Um, the, I'm going to end with, um, I'm going to end the last two slides with a quick Mary Oliver quote. Um, this is Wendy, our facilitator in the, based in the Northwest Territories, um, and, and these are Mary Oliver's words. Um, I want to think again of dangerous and noble things. I want to be light and frolicsome. I want to be improbable, beautiful, and afraid of nothing, as though I had wings. Um, and I think for me, um, a, a big part of our work is how do, you know, asking ourselves, how do we support children to have that feeling as though they had wings? Um, how do we support educators also in their work um, and, and caregivers, parents, to feel like they had wings, even though life sometimes can feel very complicated um, and, and the expectations are really high. Um, so I'll end on that note and really wanted to um, thank you for the opportunity to, to share some of these stories. Thank you so much for that. Um, Marlene, I really appreciated seeing the environment you grew up in, where you played, your kids, Hazel and Emery, and really learning about, about the four schools as well. I do realize that we are at the three o'clock mark. I, the presentations have been extremely, extremely rich, but I think we have a minute or so to field some questions. Um, and uh, you know, if, if if people have to go at three, feel free. But but if folks can stay, we're happy to field the questions as well. Jack, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ari. We do have some questions that we can uh, quickly touch on. Um, the first one I have here is for Brenda. It's uh, from Natalie Coops. Um, hi, Brenda. I'm from I'm from Northwestern Ontario, and as an educator, we have really been trying to make our outdoor play more meaningful. However, we are having a hard time getting our administration to take to get on board with allowing the mess, excuse, excuse me, allowing the mess, we keep getting a lot of barriers. How could we get Opal to help us reach out to administrators? And do you have any ideas you could share with us? Um, that's a great question. And it's a recurring question for sure. Um, well, I think on a, theoretical level, it's really worthwhile to think about all the very many, many benefits of play and the fact that those benefits are going to translate in the classroom. They're going to 
uh, positively impact the relationship between teachers and students and the relationships between students. All the classroom time becomes much easier and much richer if there's a good play environment outdoors. And you, you need to be able to convince your administration of that fundamental idea. And I would recommend that you go to our website and look for the Ryerson report, look for those clear indicators of uh, student perceptions of well-being going up and excitement about school going up. And then there's the practical side, which is it's really a big part of what we do at Opal, which is to show schools how to do it. It's not really that difficult. It certainly isn't rocket science, even though I like to reference Star Trek in my talks. Opal is not rocket science. It's being committed enough to the idea of play that you solve those problems as you encounter them. Students uh, will get dirty and they will learn how to take off their dirty clothes and enter the classroom clean. They will all learn how to bring a second pair of pants. They will know that they need to have their wellies when they go to school. These things can be taught. And so, um, so I recommend that, that as a start, you, you go into our website and start bringing up some of the, um, the theoretical and pedagogical reasons why play is important. And then um, stay in touch with us because we are developing, we are working on scaling, we are working on developing our ability to reach out long distance to schools further out from the GTHA and we want to be able to help you solve these logistical problems but um, they are very very solvable and I think that is what our experience of Opal in the GTHA is showing schools is that if you apply yourself to it you really can solve these problems they're not they're not really that complicated um, and I guess as a final note I would say do not underestimate the capacity of your students to start solving those, these problems for themselves and for you. They will figure it out. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, I have another question for both of you. Uh, Marlene, you could take it first if you like. It's, it's from Vicky Dumont. Um, do you have any studies, references, to, uh, studies, references to encourage parents to do outdoor play with their kids for caregivers to give uh, to give to parents with ideas of how to do it? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so maybe what I, I'll share, um, Outdoor Play Canada, uh, which is is currently going through um, some exciting changes um, and is being led by the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Group. Um, the website is currently being revamped and there's a lot of research and resources being added to that website currently. So if you're not um, a member, I would highly recommend looking up Outdoor Play Canada and checking for research and uh, and resources there. Um, in terms of like the specific question of how to do it, I mean, a big part of, of supporting unstructured outdoor play um, is getting out of children's way. It's both providing um, opportunities, you know, opening the doors and these like incremental opportunities on a regular basis for children to, to be outdoors. Um, and then it's to get out of their way and not direct uh, you know their their experiences while while they're there. Um, so so often when we think about play, we think about structured activities, we think about um, sports, and you know I think what Brenda and I. Um, uh, have learned through our work is is that kind of play is really beautiful and um, children also need lots of opportunities for unstructured experiences where they're leading their own play um, so my my maybe my biggest advice is um, is is finding regular opportunities and and learning to step back uh, more and more and find a community of people a community of parents who are happy to go into the woods together and um, you know maybe the adults support each other and drink coffee and, and the children play and sometimes maybe the adults will join in but uh, but that has been um, my greatest asset as a parent is uh, finding a community who want to to play with us amazing um, I just I think we have time for one more question we can fit in um, I have one here from uh, uh, Paulette um, 
actually, sorry, I have multiple coming in all at once. Um, excuse me, one moment, please. Uh, sorry, Crystals was first. Um, you both speak of supervised outdoor play. How, um, how could you mitigate liability for community-based outdoor play opportunities, uh, community playground rebuild that would not be supervised? And this could be for either Marlene or Brenda, if either of you want to take a stab at it. And Marlene, Marlene can, would you like yeah, to? I can, add, um, I can add a couple of things. Um, I mean, their the liability is, you know, uh, that comment I and the quote, uh, the research I, I shared around, um, you know, perceptions of, of liability and parental anxiety, you know, being a big barrier. Um, often, liability, um, our, our fears of liability, um, they're not founded. Um, we're in conversation with uh, uh, a, a pretty large scale um, insurance body in in Canada. Um, around a partnership, uh, and, and Frank Cowan has been engaged in um, in discussions around supporting outdoor play. So more and more, there are insurance bodies who um, really want to see um, children's access to outdoor play uh, increase throughout Canada. So um, there's also some really amazing precedents. So I think it's important to find examples of municipalities or schools or licensed childcare programs that are doing this kind of work. Um, the uh, city of Kitchener Waterloo uh, is doing amazing stuff uh, in terms, and the city of Calgary doing amazing stuff. So if you're looking at unsupervised play, um, there are really great precedents, um, municipalities and um, and uh, and other sites that are you know building adventure playgrounds or loose parts playgrounds um, and providing that space for community members and that space for families uh, to go um, and there's there's also examples of um, you know, summer programs, children camps, after school programs, uh, forest and nature school, Opal. Uh, so we're at a stage right now, I, I think a really exciting stage where there we can draw on these examples um, and we can say there's already amazing things happening across Canada. Like this is um, this is a possibility. Uh, and, and I think I always um, suggest, especially to educators, to ask questions. Um, you know, if, if you get a no to ask questions, why? I think that's really important. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just looking at the time, I think this will bring us to an end to our session. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Arlene and Brenda, for taking the time and volunteering your time to share this. It was really fascinating to listen in on. And I also want to thank everyone who attended today and asked questions. It was, it was fantastic to have you all with us. Um, and so just before we call it a day, um, Artie, did you want to briefly touch on the Knowledge Center? Yeah, just to let everyone know that um, after this um, presentation, we're going to have the presentation up at our Knowledge Center, and we, we invite you to continue the conversation on our Knowledge Center as well. It's knowledge.otf.ca. There's lots of really great resources on that site. If you've not been to it, we just encourage you to use it as a platform to continue engagement. Amazing. Alrighty then. Well. Um, that brings us to the end today. I want to thank you all again and have a terrific day, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.